All right. This paper is part of a larger project in which I am making the audacious claim that story, at least how we usually encounter it in contemporary American fiction, inherently resists scientific naturalist accounts of human experience. Now, I don't have time, of course, to give you all the pieces of that argument, but the gist of it is that I firmly believe that fiction is the art of love for persons. Aesthetic, visions, uh, aesthetic vision through which we pay loving attention to some part of creation, and in the case of stories, to people, walks hand in hand with theological vision through which we see persons as made in the image of God and found worthy by Jesus Christ to die for. So if any of this argument strikes you as crazy, it would be a good time for me to hear it now before it goes into print. <clears throat> And this is my epigraph from the book of Job, because I'm going to be talking quite a bit about Job. And I use the uh, PowerPoint just to give, put up quotes that I, you know, that you can look at while I'm talking about them so you can follow along. Alas, I don't have any exciting icons or anything like that. Right. One of my colleagues once noted that The Road is the one novel that everyone who spoke to him about reading it also reported where they were when they read it. Like John F. Kennedy's assassination, the experience of reading this hauntingly beautiful tale of trauma burns itself into the reader's brain. My own experience is similar. I read the book right after it was published and less than six months after the birth of what would be my only son, uh, my only child, my son Donovan. It was February, which I might add in this part of the country is apocalyptic. <coughs> <laughs> and I was in bed with a sinus infection and I was weeping almost every page. I couldn't stop until I got to the end. Now these are not the conditions under which I recommend reading this novel. Um, but if you haven't read it, I, there is no way I can talk about this novel without giving away the ending. So if you're one of these people who's like, I can't stand that, then I'm not gonna be offended if you get up and leave right now. There's exits all the way around because I am gonna be talking about the ending. For those of you who have not read the novel or seen the movie, the plot is very simple. A man and his young son have been surviving on their own after some sort of global incident has blighted the landscape, killed most people, and obliterated social structures. We watch as they move south toward the sea, not sure of what they will find. The man knows only that his whole life is now being given to keep his son alive. They see the worst of humanity along the way, cannibals, slavery, and other cold-blooded acts of violence. The road packs a tremendous punch. It won the Pulitzer Prize. It was an Oprah Book Club selection, so what greater honor can there be? But <clears throat> it may be McCarthy's most convincing articulation of his belief that art must engage matters of life and death if it is to have any significance at all. This is partly why it, along with McCarthy's other novels, has spurred a lot of discussion, not only about McCarthy's own beliefs or unbelief in God and man's fate, but of the general issue of the place of faith in American fiction. Paul Eli recently fueled the fire of this debate in his article called Has Fiction Lost Its Faith? in which he argued that there are no contemporary defenders of Christian theology that rival Flannery O'Connor and Walker Percy in their day and that Cormac McCarthy and Don DeLillo, quote, are seen as prophets, but Christianity in their work is a country for old men. Another scholar who has argued that American fiction has lost its faith is Amy Hungerford in her book, Postmodern Belief. She treats the road only briefly in the epilogue, but early in the book, she presents Blood Meridian as a prime example of a larger trend in American fiction to draw on biblical language to give one's book the feeling of the Bible's moral authority, but whose actual authority is merely aesthetic. Quote, we are left with the presumptuous creation of a prose that sounds like scripture, tempts one to read for metaphysical structures as if one were reading scripture, and yet withholds all but the aesthetic and sentimental effects of scripture. And get this, is what she says, in this sense, McCarthy has written in Blood Meridian a sentimental novel of the highest order. The road for Hungerford fares no better. Through its beautiful language, McCarthy, quote, transforms biblical authority into literary authority reconceived as supernatural authorship or rhetorical power, end quote. Now, I think Hungerford is right about a lot of things, especially her reading of Don DeLillo. But her understanding of how Cormac McCarthy's work interacts with the Bible is misguided, and I think it leads her 
to misread the road. I contend that while the road is not necessarily intentionally Christian, I'm not trying to say that, its beauty and its power are best explained, however, theologically, and indeed with the help of theological aesthetics. So the argument I want to present today has two parts. First, far from being a borrowed and merely aesthetic authority, McCarthy's work evokes the Bible in the way that forces the astute reader to return to it, to the Bible. Specifically, the road evokes the book of Job, and along with it, the metaphysical questions regarding personhood and suffering that it engages. Second, the novel's beauty is best explained not by an effort on McCarthy's part to replace God's authority. Instead, like the book of Job itself, the novel must be beautiful to be answerable to the goodness of man being made in the image of God, as I will answer, argue that it is. The road is, in short, under what Hans Urs von Balthasar has called the demand of the beautiful, and it pulls its readers into answerability to that demand. So first, <clears throat> the echoes of Job. Hungerford's argument that McCarthy's texts borrow the authority of the Bible without its content relies on her conviction that he is one of a long line of writers who conceive of the writer as playing God and handing out fates. The gist of my complaint is that in the case of The Road, to compare the author or the narrator to God is a confusion. The author here is better likened to the narrator, the storyteller, the transmitter of the book of Job, and the novel's narrator when he is taking on the man's perspective to Job himself. The novel's situation and subsequent soul searching thus evokes the book of the Bible most known for asking why. Why is the world full of suffering and evil? Now, I don't have time to explain this whole chart, but what it boils down to is um, in the box here that it's my contention that when the narrative's perspective, the narrator's perspective aligns closely with the man's perspective, it strongly mirrors Job's point of view and echoes the biblical language. We are being asked by this, I believe, to compare their situations and their attitudes, the man and Job. Recall that Job has no idea why his world has suddenly fallen apart. He receives messengers, one after the other, who inform him that his livestock servants and entire family have been struck down and destroyed. He rips his clothes, shaves his head, drops to his knees in despair, but does not curse God with his lips or charge him with wrongdoing. Then he experiences boils on his skin, he repeatedly declares that he loathes his own life. He says he speaks with bitterness in his soul, and he laments his own birth with a metaphysical intensity and a real poetic beauty. Now, I will read this large portion of Job 3 so that you can get the feeling of it. And those of you who have read the book, The Road, you'll really recognize some of the language here. Let the day perish on which I was born, and the night that said, a man is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it, nor light shine upon it. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds dwell upon it. Let the blackness of the day terrify it. That night, let thick darkness seize it. Let it not rejoice among the days of the year. Let it not come into the number of the months. Behold, let that night be barren. Let no joyful cry enter it. Let those curse it who curse the day who are ready to rouse up Leviathan. Let the stars of, the, of its dawn be dark. Let it hope for light, but have none, nor see the eyelids in the morning, of the morning, because it did not shut the doors of my mother's womb, nor hide trouble from my eyes. This is a guy who's in despair, right? And to add to all of this, Job's wife, rather than being an encouragement to him, tells him to curse God and die. His situation is what my nine-year-old son might describe as epically bad. <clears throat> now to the man in the road. The man in the road's situation is as suddenly dire and as weirdly severe as Job's. At 117, on the day his wife would give birth to his only son, the clocks stop and the world as they knew it came to an end, leaving them in a barren landscape grown increasingly cold and dark. There is ash everywhere. There is a blackness that is so sightless and impenetrable that the narrator insists it would, quote, hurt your ears with listening. They walk in a cold, autistic dark where the only voices full of any human feeling are their own voices, the limited conversation between father and son. The narrator's tone, especially when clearly aligned with the man's, is as metaphysical as that of Job's. Quote, 
On this road, there are no God spoke men. They are gone, and I am left, and they have taken with them the world. Query, how does the never to be differ from what never was? The man and his son have been long abandoned by their wife and mother's suicide. A wife and mother whose only answer, like Job's wife, had been, literally, to curse God and die. In short, the man and the boy's isolation in the landscape is total. Their story feels like following a small flickering flame moving slowly in a field of utter darkness. Now another similarity between Job and the road has to do with the cosmic size of their complaints and their desires, the man and uh, Job, to be seen by God. George Steiner, though I disagree with a lot of his perspective, perceptively argues that Job's lament of his own birth echoes that of Jeremiah. But, quote, in Job, it is no individual. It is the cosmos which is cursed. The day is to be made darkness. Let the stars of the twilight thereof be dark. Let light go out undoing, uncreating God's primordial fiat, fiat, end quote. When Job asks why he was born, saying, blessed are the infants that never saw the light, according to Steiner, Job is not lamenting his individual situation as much as declaring the suffocating blackness of extinction, the worry over why anyone should be born only to face suffering and death. Now, the structure of Job, as you know, is that of the three false counselors trying to find fault with Job himself, and then Job insisting on his own innocence. The counselors provide a series of attempts to explain God's actions when no explanation really makes sense. Now, the whole book is mostly a dialogue. Why is that important? Well, we've been hearing, in fact, I want to at several points insert Professor Augustine's paper here. <laughs> um, why is this important? Primarily because it sets up God's appearance as the end to the whole conversation. As Lindsay Wilson puts it, quote, throughout the dialogue, Job's God-directed cries and complaints are best viewed as calls on the seemingly absent God to become present. Though he strongly accuses God, he longs to speak to God in person in a relationship in which God would call and Job would answer. Once a dialogue with God, and he gets it. <clears throat> he wants not just to hear from God, he wants the full authority of God's presence, not the substituting the substitute rationalizing of the counselors. And this is part of what explains, I think, the famous monologue from chapter 19, right? Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. This, of course, is Job talking. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. Job's desire to have his life recorded in a book coincides with the desire, his desire to see God, to know that he is there and is not silent, to know, in short, that God sees him. Job's friends can never explain God's actions, and their presence cannot take his place. Now, my primary point in making this comparison is to say that in the road, the man's voice, like Job's, can best be described as lament. When the man addresses God, it is also to shake his fist and plead with him to show himself. This is from the road. He descended into a grike in the stone, and there he crouched, coughing, and coughed for a long time. Then he just knelt in the ashes. He raised his face to the paling day. Are you there, he whispered. Will I see you at last? Have you a neck by which to throttle you? Have you a heart? Damn you eternally, have you a soul? Oh God, he whispered, oh God. Now the question here, are you there, feels to me more like where are you than it does do you exist, God? But certainly this is a debatable point. I do see, however, a difference between the man's point of view here and the point of view of the men in the naturalistic story, The Open Boat, by Stephen Crane, in which we are told of the men in peril for their lives that they, quote, wished to throw stones at the temple and hated deeply the fact that there were no stones and no temples. <clears throat> now, while James Wood thinks that McCarthy's text only gets theological at the end, he says that McCarthy just kind of tacks on theology at the end, I beg to differ. 
I think that McCarthy puts the man and the boy in this post-apocalyptic scenario to exaggerate the greatest metaphysical and theological questions that face us all, our own existence, our brokenness, the fact that things fall apart, the fact that we have power to kill others, to destroy the earth. People die. Why are things this way? Both Job and the man in the road see themselves as cursed by God, but it is also true that the main thing that they have in common is that neither one of them chooses to curse God either by behaving, by behaving like an animal or by taking their own lives. Both of them, in some way, choose life. Now to my second part of the paper, The Demand of the Beautiful. If I'm correct that McCarthy is evoking the book of Job in order to draw readers into a metaphysical dialogue and theological dialogue with the biblical book, and not, as Hungerford would have it, to draw an ersatz authority from it, then there are several implications. The first, as I've already suggested, is that the metaphysical questions regarding our suffering existence are engaged. But it also means that the question of whether or not God will show up in the end of the narrative is more than just a matter of flipping a coin. It is a question, I think, that is written into the structure of the narrative itself, and I will get to that end in a bit. Another implication that may not be as readily apparent is the issue of the beauty of the language of the novel. Now, Job, as you know, is one of the most poetic books of the Bible, and its beauty, I would definitely argue, serves a much greater purpose than ornament. One of those purposes is to suggest the mystery of the beauty of creation, particularly of humankind made in the image of God and attended to by God. If I am correct in my audacious thesis that aesthetic vision and theological vision walk hand in hand, then the degree to which the road succeeds as art, which in one sense means to succeed in being beautiful, it also inevitably touches on the theological. In some way, it points to a divine other who created the world and called it good and paid attention to it. So now we need to talk about this word beauty, right? When narrative art describes actions and scenes as horrifying as those in the road, like a baby over a spit, right? We know that we are dealing with a definition of beauty that is much deeper than the sentimental and kitschy warmth of a Thomas Kincaid painting. Now this is why I felt the need to turn to Hans Urs von Balthasar's theological aesthetics. Now I, I picked out a few things from this volume that took, seems like most of my sabbatical, like 900 pages, uh, the first volume of seven to read. So, you know, bear with me if I don't have it perfect. <laughs> um, the passage I'm going to share with you appears as Balthasar has begun to make the case that beauty should not be considered apart from the other two non-platonic transcendentals, truth and goodness, and that art for art's sake is thus a meaningless and destructive concept. That's what he starts by talking about. It is when man no longer believes in truth and goodness that he severs beauty away from them and makes it into a mere mask, a surface thing, with no capabilities greater than giving a few sensual delights or selling things, right? And so, quote, we no longer dare to believe in beauty and we make of it a mere appearance in order the more easily to dispose of it. Since beauty is an inherent part, he says, of the truth and goodness of the world God has created, disposing of it in this manner is an effort by man to reject the mystery of being and in so doing to reject the creator of that mystery. So beauty, when it is severed from goodness and truth, points only to itself and not to another being. And this he calls aestheticism. Now, it's important for me to point out that for von Balthasar, you can do this. You can try to separate beauty from goodness and truth. But when you make this artificial separation, when you make beauty into a mere mask, an image that you can manipulate for your own interest, you go against your best God-given instincts which can be summarized as the desire to go out of yourself in order to connect with another. And this is where I insert Professor Augustine's paper, including the ultimate other, which is God. Now, it's at this point that von Balthasar writes, and the bolding here is my emphasis. And it's a longish quote, bear with me, it's really good. Now, I want us to think through this together. Through his body, man is in the world. As he expresses himself, he acts and intervenes responsibly in the general situation. 
he inscribes his deeds indelibly upon the book of history, which whether he likes it or not, henceforth bears his imprint permanently. And here I have to just interrupt and say that the short film we saw of the suicide bridge now haunts me through this passage in a new way. Here at the very latest, man must realize that he is not Lord over himself. Neither does he rule his own being in freedom so as to confer form upon himself, nor is he free in his communication. As body, man is a being whose condition it is always to be communicated. Indeed, he regains himself only on account of having been communicated. Sorry, missed the slide. For this reason, man as a whole is not an archetype of being and of spirit. This is Balthazar's quote still. Rather, their image. He is not the primal word, but a response. He is not a speaker, but an expression governed by the laws of beauty, laws which man cannot impose on himself. As a totality of spirit and body, man must make himself into God's mirror and seek to attain to that transcendence and radiance that must be found in the world's substance if it is indeed God's image and likeness, his word and gesture, action and drama. Okay, there's a lot there. I'm going to unpack it a little bit. This is why he goes on to say that man's being in its origin is already form. It's already a picture, an image of God. It cannot cease to be that. This passage is part of a complicated ar argument, but the first part of the quotation Balthazar describes the human condition in a way that will be familiar to readers of The Road. The man's actions in the world of the novel do indeed make marks upon it, some good and some bad. But here's the important thing. McCarthy records all of these actions in a book. Oh, that my deeds were written down. This kind of attention paid to individual persons as if their lives matter is why we even have the novel as a genre in the first place. Novels, I think, like The Road and many other works of fiction, tacitly assent to Balthazar's argument that man is not lord over himself. In his words, he cannot confer form upon himself. Balthazar's argument is very similar that, to that made by Mikhail Bakhtin, who compares the author's consciousness to God's only, not as creator, but only in that it reveals that aesthetic vision is that which, by definition, a person cannot have of oneself. This is why Parker gets a tattoo on his back. Just for those of you who are Flannery O'Connor fans. <clears throat> No matter how McCarthy may try to deflect us by never naming the boy or the man in the road, McCarthy has set us up to see this particular man and his son's life as significant. McCarthy is the one who has drawn us to the beauty of this particular man's life and his struggle, and to the importance, I would argue, of their moral choices. In the next part of his argument, Balthazar insists that a person is not free in his communication. You remember, he is instead a being whose condition it is always to be communicated, and he regains himself thereby. The man in his story is communicated here, and thus they participate in a kind of being, albeit fictional, but it's analogically related to those who open themselves up to the idea that all persons' lives are communicated to someone somewhere all the time. That is God. We are seen by God. We have been seen by him since the beginning. By writing the story of this man and boy, McCarthy participates in this idea, whether intentionally or not. That's the audacious part. Now let's see some places of ascent. In the first two pages of the book, just the very beginning, we are introduced to the man who awakens from a bad dream and then quickly reaches out for the boy to make sure he's there. So from the very first, the novel is about human connection. And before the boy wakes up, the man surveys the area, and the text reads that, quote, the man sat there holding the binoculars and watching the ashen daylight congeal over the land. He knew only that the child was his warrant. He said, if he is not the word of God, God never spoke. The man, who speaks very little, I might add, throughout the novel, says these words aloud in a way that McCarthy emphasizes with the words he said, which those of you who have read this recently, my students, are, are often excised from the trimmed down dialogue of the book as a whole. It hardly ever says he said. And so this is emphasizing that it's spoken. 
Thus, the man literally communicates the boy, as well as indicating that the boy is a communication of God. I do not think, like some critics do, that the boy is meant here to be a parallel to Jesus as the word of God, necessarily. I think aesthetic vision in this case is more like the divine speech act theory idea. It requires one person looking at another, speaking that other into existence, or acknowledging that other by speech. The boy turns and opens his eyes, and we observe their first dialogue. Hi, Papa, he said, I'm right here. I know. Here they are, speaking, reminding each other that they're there. Being spoken into existence as the word of God in creation is for Balthazar the reason why man is not an archetype of being in spirit as if competing with God. He is instead made in the image of God. Man is not a primal word, he argues, but a response. He is not a speaker, but an expression governed by the laws of beauty, laws which man cannot impose upon himself. Now, it's this last phrase that drew me to this project. I read it first in an article by Jen Zimmerman. Zimmerman argues, along with Balthazar, that theology, quote, establishes aesthetics as integral to self-knowledge, and as such, Christian scholars must engage the notion of the aesthetic. We can't ignore it. He translates the Balthazar passage I quoted earlier directly from the German himself, and this is the way he translates it. Same passage, so you get a chance to see it again. All our acts of self-expression are embedded in history and leave traces we cannot alter. We are not original in being and spirit, but copy. Not original word, but answering word. Not freely speaking, but expressed meaning, and therefore completely under the demand of the beautiful, which we ourselves cannot control. And when our New Testament scholar was speaking this morning, I was thinking about response, responsibility. That's what it is, able to respond. <clears throat> Following von Balthasar, Zimmermann argues that recognition of the beautiful in the mystery of being has the inherent power to draw viewers into contemplation of something deeper. Man, made in the image of God, is beautiful and shows the beauty of all being. Jacques Maritain put it this way, when something is beautiful as such, it, quote, belongs to the kingdom of, spirit, of the spirit and plunges deep into the transcendence and the infinity of being, end quote. Now, the point of all this is to say when aesthetics are properly bound up with the true and the good, centered on the mystery of being, it is no longer possible to dismiss the ugliness of the post-apocalyptic world McCarthy presents as theologically irrelevant or as hostile to theism. Nor is it possible to argue that McCarthy's theological passages are just tacked on in a last ditch attempt to make a materialistic and naturalistic novel appear to be metaphysical. Instead, the entire novel reveals that when mankind turns the world into an ash heap, he makes it harder, but not impossible, to recognize the beauty and goodness of creation. This partly explains why the novel is concerned so parabolically with darkness and light. It's everywhere. The man and the boy face a world growing increasingly dim. Indeed, the apocalyptic blight, whatever it was, we're not given is described as a, a cold glaucoma dimming the world, leaving them quite bereft of warmth and direction. Now, seen this way, the debated expression that the man and the boy are carrying the fire. There's lots of debate. What does it mean that they're carrying the fire? In my interpretation, that expression has core significance. Now, of course, they're not literally carrying the fire. This phrase stands for, among other things, that the man and the boy are trying to be the good guys. Right? They're trying not to give up. They're trying not to eat people. They're trying not to kill anyone except when their immediate lives are in danger. In short, they're trying to retain their humanity. That's what it means in part to carry the fire. In these actions, they become a beacon of light in utter blackness. And it's evocative, I think, of John chapter 1. The light shines in darkness, but the darkness has not overcome it. They're, they're carrying it. Indeed, every time the man looks at the boy, he sees him as beautiful light so beautiful that he cannot bring himself to take the boy's life to prevent others from hurting him. And that's one of the main dramas in it. It's like, should I take this gun and just shoot him to, so, to spare him from being raped and eaten and other things? And then there's this beautiful passage. There were times when he sat watching the boy sleep that he would begin to sob uncontrollably, but it wasn't about death. He wasn't sure what it was about, but he thought that it was about beauty or about goodness. 
things that he had no longer any way to think about at all. Of course we see here that the man is thinking about beauty and goodness, though the passage also emphasizes that the structures that make these thoughts possible are quickly dissipating due, I think, to the man and boy's increasing isolation in the landscape of the story world. But the structures of these thoughts certainly exist for us, and they are right here in this novel, which touches goodness, beauty in multiple ways and invites us to do the same. To put it very simply, this is not an ugly novel, right? The novel is beautiful because it does recognize a difference between light and dark, between goodness and evil. Furthermore, the drama of the novel, like the book of Job, surrounds the question of whether or not man will curse God and die precisely because, precisely because he or his son will lose completely any way of thinking about beauty or goodness, anything, in other words, that makes life worth living. This loss, and not death, is what the man is sobbing about, and it's a powerfully theological moment. Now, a word about isolation. Oh, in this novel, the man and the boy, in order to survive, are forced out of their isolation at home and onto the road, where the man is rightly suspicious of most people they meet, people who have turned to evil ways to survive, who have banded loving cooperation for slavery and cannibalism. By the time we are introduced to the father and son, they are completely isolated and they have become each other's world entire, which of course is not a sustainable situation in the long run. Their isolation, in fact, increasingly removes them from seeing the created goodness of others. Going back to your paper, they need each other, other goodness people to see God in the world, to see goodness in other people, and they can't because they're alone. I think this explains why the man and the boy are so desperate to continue speaking to one another, though their dialogue becomes quite clipped and dangerously imitative because of their isolation. It also explains why the narrator and the man's consistent observance of the world is that language itself is dissolving along with the general decreation of the world. And as they camped, the man tried to think of something to say, and he could not, and here it is. He'd had this feeling before, beyond the numbness and dull despair, the world shrinking down about a raw core of parsable entities, the names of things slowly following those things into oblivion, colors, the names of birds, things to eat, Finally, the names of things one believed to be true, more fragile than he would have thought. How much was gone already? The sacred idiom shorn of its reference and so of its reality, drawing down like something trying to preserve heat, in time to wink out forever. This appears to be the narrator's rendering of the man's perspective, though again, it's somewhat ambiguous. Either way, the worry is that the world of things is shrinking down, and with it, the names of those things. The narrator seems convinced that the world is decreating all around the man and the boy, and that eventually language itself is going to disappear, leaving a gray world with no distinctions whatsoever. Now, we are left, I think, with three choices of how to read the beautiful language in this book that is simultaneously describing the decay of things and of language, right? Beautiful language in this book, describing the decay of things and language. And here are my theses. <clears throat> my students are, they're ready to take me down, right? We've had some good arguments about this already. First, you could say the novel as language is modern. It's as, as, as an effort to shore up against these ruins. Um, as we T.S. Eliot phrase, such as Hungerford might argue with the artist taking God's place in creating the world through language, right? That's one thesis. Second, the novel itself and its beautiful language is simply a nostalgic remembering of a former beauty that is disintegrating. That's one way to read it. Or third, that the novel and its beautiful language insists that as long as someone is carrying the fire of goodness and truth, beauty is also never really lost. Now, while I do not believe the first thesis for reasons I'll explain, the second remains compelling to me, and I still could be convinced, but you know. The narrator provides numerous descriptions of the dissolving world like the one we read above. But if we read these laments of the dissolving world in light of their echo of the book of Job, the second thesis is harder to abide by. And the largest bit of evidence we have against this thesis is the novel's ending, the discovery of the boy after his father's death by what is unquestionably a friendly group of people, 
a trustworthy community with children. So the immediate plot resolution is that the father's sacrifice was not in vain. His refusal to curse God and die was rewarded by, even though the father didn't know about it. Now, as if that fact wasn't enough, McCarthy gives this penultimate paragraph. The woman, when she saw him, this is the second to last paragraph, right? Put her arms around him and held him. Oh, she said, I am so glad to see you. Sometimes this still kind of stirs me. <clears throat> I've read it so many times. But she would talk to him sometimes about God. He tried to talk to God, but the best thing was to talk to his father, his father who was just dead. And he did talk to him, and he didn't forget. The woman said that was all right. She said that the breath of God was his breath, yet though it passed from man to man through all of time. Now, against the silent waste of suicide and abdication, and now, specifically, in the name of God, the boy takes on the activity of talking to, speaking forth, and not forgetting his father. Of course, there's not anything necessarily Christian about this particular conception of God, and it's not my purpose to argue that. But it is certainly possible to read this as God showing up in the primary way that he does today, in people who name him as God and love others in his name. This idea is consistent with Balthazar's insistence that man is an image of God and a response, not an archetype and a primal speaker. Simply put, the passage is overtly theological in a way that McCarthy could have easily avoided. There is no reason why he had to put this paragraph in. Now consider the similarity of this passage to a quote from Theophilus of Antioch. God has given to the earth the breath which feeds it. It is his breath that gives life to all things. And if he were to withhold his breath, everything would be annihilated. His breath vibrates in yours, in your voice. It is the breath of God that you breathe, and you are unaware of it. God answers Job's queries, not with explanations, but with himself, right? His voice, his breath, Job 38. Here, God answers the man's queries through this family that continues, I think, to talk about God and to God. Another way to argue this is to remember that what the boy finds in the end is goodness in the form of other persons who are also carrying the fire, not luck. Luck is as impersonal as the flip of a coin. Goodness in our world requires a human face. With this passage, whether he meant to or not, McCarthy reveals his great love for the father and the son, love that is too deep to either leave them in despair or to leave their story untold. He'll say, oh, I didn't know how it was going to end. I just flipped, you know, whatever. Don't believe it. <laughs> Thus, McCarthy reveals how aesthetic vision and theological vision, I think, walk hand in hand. So when it comes to the three possible explanations for the beauty of this novel, you guessed it, I lean toward number three. The good, the beautiful, and the true bear the imprint of God in the world, whether we choose to see him in that imprint or not. If human persons are all made in the image of God, and are all under the demand of the beautiful in the way that Balthazar describes. If persons are beautiful according to the laws of being that they neither make nor control, then McCarthy is participating in this logic by making the passages of the road sing and hum as they do. This is what I think Jacques Maritain meant when he said that, quote, the artist, whether he knows it or not, consults God in looking at things. This is also why in his book on beauty, Roger Scruton argues that beauty is not a property ascribed, this is a very important point, the beauty is not a property ascribed to some things and not other things. It's more like a posture toward the things seen. Beauty demands an act of attention and it may be expressed in many different ways. Less important than the final verdict is the attempt to show what is right, fitting, worthwhile, attractive, or expressive in the object. In other words, to identify the aspect of the thing that claims our attention. It's difficult for me to overemphasize how important this is. So now, the controversy, more of a controversy. Let's consider anew the immense lamenting beauty of the last, this is the final paragraph of the novel. Beautiful. Once there were brook trout in the streams in the mountains. You could see them standing in the amber current where the white edges of their fins wimpled softly in the flow. They smelled of moss in your hand. 
polished and muscular and torsional. On their backs were vermiculate patterns that were maps of the world and its becoming, maps and mazes of a thing which could not be put back, not be made right again. In the deep glens where they lived, all things were older than man, and they hummed of mystery. Now Hungerford, remember, argues that it is, quote, the words and not the light that hold out hope, that put the speckled trout back into the river and the river back into the valley and make things right again, even as the words say, these things cannot be done. In other words, McCarthy is reveling in his godlike power in using language to recreate the world. It's tempting to take this position, but I am not convinced. I don't think this position adequately explains the novel's power. I don't think it's a mere aesthetic power. We should not forget, for instance, that we have spent 200 pages before this passage appears, attentively and parabolically following a man who loves his son and refuses to give in to evil. We have cheered on the father and son as they carry the fire, believing like Job against their circumstances that a light still shines in the world and the darkness has not overcome it. What else but beauty has the power to draw our attention to the essential beauty of being that humanity is always and everywhere in danger of ignoring or desecrating? For we, like Job and like the man, have the choice of life or death before us all the time. If we choose to let it, the light of goodness and love in the world can indeed flicker and grow dim. Think about it. Maybe McCarthy is more of a prophet than he even knows. Maybe this is how the world is going to end the second time. When the Son of Man returns to bring justice, will he find faith on the earth? So perhaps it is that his final paragraph of the novel, taking place as it does after the appearance of God in the loving faces and voices of the good family, prophetically warns us of our peril. It warns us that when we destroy our world or blur it almost to the point of non-recognition, we lose a lot. What we lose is a map to the world and its creation and its becoming. The whole story, maybe, of why we are here at all. Words cannot replace the map of creation. They also cannot replace living human beings if we decide to erase the image of God in this world by annihilating ourselves and each other. The created world is old, and everything in it still hums of mystery. The question is, and has always been, whether or not we will hear it. <laughs>